I want to start today talking a little bit about some vision, cast a little bit of vision about where we are as a church and what's going on with us as a church. You know our mission or our vision statement is this, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus. And uh, we are a church that focuses on both the evangelism part and the discipleship part, because I believe that you can't be the kind of church you should be without both. Bringing people, that's what we're about. We're about winning people to Jesus Christ. We're about inviting people. During this pandemic, it's been easy to get out of the habit of inviting people. We say one of our value statements is inviting is evangelism. And I want to encourage you to invite people. And uh, the, uh, the center part of that, bringing people wherever they are, that's an important part because we want to be a church that opens our arms wide. We want to be a hospital for the sick. We don't want to be a country club for the initiated. We believe that the church should be the first place that people who have sin in their life turn to. It is sad, a sad commentary on the state of the Christian church that so many people feel that the last place they need to go when they don't know Christ, when they have sin in their life, is the church. But wherever they are, we've had people that are in this room, that you started coming here and you had not been in church in years, wherever they are. We've had people that uh, started coming to this church that didn't even believe in God, wherever they are. We've had people that uh, started coming to this church that weren't saved, and they got saved and baptized, wherever they are. We've had some mature believers that started coming to this church, wherever they are. And, And I really do believe that as a church, we must embrace the mess. Life is messy. And if we're going to be the kind of church that God wants us to be, we've got to be that. I've had this happen several times uh, in the last 20 years pastoring this church. Been out, saw a person that had recently gotten saved or baptized in our church, and they wanted to introduce me to their friends. And here's how they introduced me. You need to meet uh, our pastor, and you need to come to this church. It's a hell of a church. And... You know, and I really thought about that. There are a lot of Christians that are more concerned about someone saying the word hell than there are people actually dying and going there. And I don't ever, ever want us to be that way. You know why? Because our job is to bring people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, give me a church full of, of people that say Avalon Church is a hell of a church and we'll change the world. We'll change the world. (laughs) Let's not be the church that points fingers and throws stones, but let's bring them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not enough to bring them here. We got to take them to where God wants them to be. Well, because of that, that's why we're doing our part. You say, what is that? Well, we're planning to move. We're buying building, uh, building and land, and uh, God's uh, just working on us. And we told you a couple weeks ago that we're working through a process. We've hired an attorney. Uh, we've heard from the county commissioners, and they think that everything's going to be okay uh, with our move. And uh, so it's very exciting, but it's just going to take a little bit of time. Uh, let me show you a couple numbers. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but basically to date, Total cash on hand, $397,936.96. We're just about $102,000 away from the amount that we need to close. Now, make sure you understand, we don't close if we don't get that, okay? And we've got more than enough commitments for this, and I just want to encourage you to stay faithful, keep on at it. Uh, You're doing great, and I'm so excited about our future, and I do believe this with all of my heart. I believe the best is yet to come. I believe that the next 20 years are going to be much greater than the first 20 years. I'm convinced of that, and uh, I really believe that God's going to allow me to be here for another 20 years as your pastor. I may not have too many marbles rolling around upstairs, uh, but y'all can just let me sit on the front row and just, uh, you know, uh, give me some pudding or something, and I'll be fine. Uh, But I'm so excited about what God's doing uh, in our church Um, One other thing I want to remind you about, and this is big about our vision, we want to challenge you over the next 10 days that you join us in a time of prayer and fasting. Our theme is called Awakening, 
And it's 10 days of prayer and fasting. You say, why are we doing this? Well, I want you to pray about the prayer requests you have, health, salvation of loved ones, raise at work, your finances, getting out of debt, your children, your marriage, whatever it is that you want to pray. But the number one thing I want you to do over the next 10 days is ask God to give you a bigger vision of him, to give you a spiritual awakening. You see, we can come to God with all kinds of requests, but the number one thing that we need in our life, you know what it is? It's to be able to see Jesus for who he is. When we do that, everything's going to be okay. Trust me. Everything's going to be okay. And over the next 10 days, we're going to do a Daniel fast. If you don't know what that is, basically it's eating fruit and vegetables for 10 days. Um, Comes out of the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, the same guy that was thrown to the den of lions. Uh, He fasted and he went without bread and uh, went without sweets, went without meat and without alcohol. And so for 10 days, we're asking you to do that. But if you don't pray along with it, all you're doing is going on a diet. And so what we want to do is we want to pray as a church. And I'm going to ask you to come together. Now, I realize that not every one of you is going to be able to be here every time we have the doors open. We are going to open the doors three times a day for the next 10 days. Every morning at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be standing right here in this room. And uh, if you show up, we're going to pray together, okay? Uh, We're going to have the doors open from 6 to 7 in the morning, from 12 to 1 in the afternoon, and from 6 to 7 in the evening. And I want you to come. I want everybody in this room, listen to me, everybody in this room to come as often as you can. Come at least once, okay? Uh, Next Sunday after church from 12 to 1, we're going to have prayer right after it. The very least you can do is stay for that one. And so uh, we're going to be praying, and we're going to ask God to do some great, great things. And uh, we're going to uh, encourage you over the next 10 days. I have made some devotions over the next 10 days. They last between seven to nine minutes. And every day there's going to be a devotion. You can go to our Facebook page and see it every day. Uh, You can join us. uh, Just lots of stuff uh, that you can pray about. So I hope you will. And I'm excited about what God is going to be doing in our church over the next 10 days. Well, today we start a brand new series called Joshua, How God Turns Setbacks into Comebacks. And we're going to be telling you five stories from the book of Joshua, and um, we're going to share those with you. And the book of Joshua is about the nation of Israel after they had been delivered from slavery in Egypt, and God used Joshua, who was the military commander and Moses' assistant, to take them into the promised land. Now, you may want to know what that means, what that represents. So to understand the stories that we're going to talk about over the next uh, several weeks, you need to hear the story before the story. It's always important to get the story before the story. And so hundreds of years earlier, God made a promise to Abraham. He was known as Abram at the time before God changed his name. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is God's promise to Abram. And he says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. Now, here's the key phrase in this promise. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What does that mean? Well, in him, in other words, from his loins, from his seed, from his offspring would come a Messiah, a Savior of the world, that all of the world would have the access to the Father to be made right with God through our Lord and Savior. You want to guess who that was? That was Jesus Christ. So God made this promise to Abraham. This is what we know as the Abrahamic covenant. And it is a covenant of God's grace. See, this this covenant was not about works. It was not about keeping the law. This was 400 plus years before the law was even given. This was God's promise of his grace that will be poured out on his people. Now, the land that he is promising to Abraham is twofold. 
It is both a literal land, the promised land there in Israel even today, okay? It was both a literal land, but it was also a representation of what was to come. So we're going to see in uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, God again, he made this promise. He said, I will give to you and your offspring um, after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. And then notice what he said, for an eternal possession, an eternal possession. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but if God promises that one day this earth as we know it is going to be destroyed, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth at the very least, it's going to be going back to what it was before the fall, before sin entered into this world. Uh, we know that he must be talking about something besides just that physical land, but he's talking about heaven, the new heavens and the new earth, because he says that it's an eternal possession and I will be their God. And then I want you to note what uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 says. It says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. What does that sound like? A city whose builder and maker was God. A city designed and built by God. What does that sound like? That sounds like heaven, doesn't it? That sounds like the new Jerusalem. That sounds like the time that God has promised to us that God is going to dwell with us. He is going to be with us for all of eternity. Oh, what a glorious day that's going to be. And then I want you to see what Jesus understood about that when he was here on this earth. John chapter 8, verse 56. He says, these are the words of Jesus. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. Abraham, he may not have known Jesus' name, but he knew that God was sending a Savior into the world. He knew that God was sending a Messiah, and so he looked forward to the coming of Jesus, and notice what it says. Jesus said, Abraham saw it and was glad. He saw it, and he was glad. Well, I believe that it, when we look at the promised land, which is what this whole book of Joshua is about, Entering into the promised land, it's about salvation, but it's also more than that. So it's one of those things that has maybe dual meaning. When we look at the promised land, we know that God says that there is an eternal city coming. There is a time of eternity that God is going to dwell with us. And Abraham looked forward to that and was glad. But also the land of promise, the promised land represents something more. It represents, um, if you will, deliverance or, if you will, the kind of life that God wants believers to have. Because we know that deliverance from Egypt represented salvation. Whenever you come to know Christ, what does God do for you? He delivers you from sin. It doesn't mean that you won't sin again. But it means that God has forgiven you and he has delivered you from that old life. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. You're a brand new creation, the Bible says. So we know that God delivers, but wandering in the wilderness for 40 years represents people who are saved, but who have not yet believed fully for God's promises. They haven't received the full promise of God's rest and God's salvation. Not that they're not saved, but they haven't received the full promise of God's rest and God's grace. You know, there are a lot of believers. They've been delivered, just like the, uh, the Jewish people from Egypt. They were delivered. But did you know that because of their unbelief, and we're going to look at that story today, because of their unbelief, they wandered, disconnected in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't get the promise that God had promised to them, even though it was given to them, and God had said, it's yours. I am with you. Now, you got to wonder. I mean, when they began to doubt God, like what we're going to see in just a moment when we read the story, they were just recently delivered from Egypt. Do you get that they saw miracles happen in their life? Remember the 10 plagues? 
Remember how God uh, sent Moses and they turned water to blood and uh, there was the plague of flies and frogs and we won't go through all the plagues, but they saw God deliver them. It was incredible what God did. The death of the firstborn and God said, uh, this night you'll sacrifice an innocent lamb, which is a picture of Jesus Christ, and you'll take his blood and you'll put it on the doorpost and on the sides, which makes the picture of a cross. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. And God delivered them. And then they were delivered from Egypt, and God gave them the spoils, the riches of Egypt to take with them. And what happened? They went out, and they were in front of the Red Sea. There was a mountain on both sides, and Pharaoh's army was chasing them. Oh, they were terrified, but what else happened? God said, Moses, you hold your staff up, and he did, and God parted the sea. And they marched across on dry ground. And when Pharaoh's army tried to go through it, God sent the water back and killed them all. Now, would you agree with me that that was pretty spectacular stuff? And yet, just days after this, they began to doubt God. Now, there are many Christians that do this, and they never get to go into that place, that better life that the promised land represents, that place of a blessed life, that place of happiness, that place of success and victory in Christ. You see, the Bible tells us in this story that the promised land is a place of abundance and prosperity, and it's a place of peace and rest. Of course, the Bible also tells us that Jesus is our rest. And unfortunately, there are many Christians that never enter into that place of grace and that place of rest. Oh, they're in a place of worry. They're in a place of fear. They're in a place of wandering, but they're not in that place where they get connected to Jesus and they rest in faith, and they rest in him. Well, let's pick up in Joshua chapter 1, and we'll read just the first two verses out of this story today. And it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Now, once again, in order to understand the story, you got to get the story before the story. And 40 years before this, uh, God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt And as they were preparing to enter the promised land, Moses sent 12 spies into the land and to bring back a report to the people. And what he told them, he said, you go look at it, you tell us what it looks like, and you bring back a report. And of course, you probably have uh, heard this story if you were in Sunday school as a child uh, about the uh, 12 spies, 10 were bad and 2 were good. You remember the hand gestures that go with that. And uh, so these spies went into the land, and what they brought back was incredible. Uh, They said this was a place of abundance. They found a single cluster of grapes. Get this. A single cluster of grapes that was so large, they had to put it on a pole and carry it between two men. That's pretty spectacular. That is a pretty um, affluent and blessed place. They actually called it a land that was flowing with milk and honey. So let's go back right to that in Numbers and read the story before the story. Numbers 13 verses 27 to 33. And it says, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed bountiful, a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. And here is the kind of fruit it produces. They showed him the grapes. But, but, do you ever just live in the land of but? Oh yeah, there's something out there that's good and we know that it's a blessing, but, they said, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified and we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak and the Amalekites live in the Negev. That was the desert there. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. 
and along the Jordan Valley. By the way, because they did not conquer these people the way God had promised to be with them, that they would if they'd obeyed him. Do you know that these are the very people that caused the Israelites problems all of their existence? To this day, are still causing them problems? Uh, They were the ones that conquered them. People from this group of people were the ones that conquered them later on. But Caleb tried to quiet the people. You see, there were two people that said, no, this, we need to go forward with this. It was Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two. Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let us go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report. You ever notice that bad news travels like wildfire? Bad attitudes travel like wildfire. You ever notice that? Man, people can believe a lie in a hurry. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. And the land that we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Well, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today about how to turn setbacks into comebacks and how that you can respond biblically when you fail. When you fail. I didn't say if you fail. Well, I've got some bad news followed by some great news for you today. The bad news is this. Ready? You're a sinner. Now, I know that as a believer, you're technically a saint. God's delivered you. He's justified you. You're no longer positionally a sinner. But the bad news is you've sinned before and you're going to do it again. And that's because that when we get saved, the Spirit of God lives in us, but we still have the old sinful nature. And you have failed, and you're going to do it again. Now, positionally, you are declared righteous, but notice what Romans 3.23 says, for it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I'm getting ready to share something with you that is going to make me, make you very glad that I'm your pastor. It's going to really probably blow some of your minds at how deep and intelligent that I really am. Now, you may not know this, but the New Testament was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek, okay? And there is a Greek word for the English word all, when it says for all have sinned, and I'm going to tell you what that word means, and you need to get ready for this because it's going to blow your mind. It means, drum roll please, all. It means all. Now don't you feel educated? Don't you feel smarter having come to church today? For all, you know what that means? It means everybody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even you, you have failed. You have sinned. And the bad news is you're going to do it again. And any Christian that says that they don't ever sin, they are committing the sin of lying. Because the fact is we all sin, even after we're saved, even after we become followers of Christ. Now, hopefully, you're letting the Spirit of God work in you and change you. You're a new creation. You're no longer enslaved to the sin that once held you. But even as a pastor, I sin. Uh, Even as the leader of this church, I sin. It may surprise you to know that there's times that when I'm driving in in McDonough traffic and Henry County traffic, that I don't always act like a Christian. In fact, there are times, and I'm going to kind of, because this is breaking me up, giving me a little bit of tears, (laughs) and you can weep for me. There are times I even say bad words. And I know you don't believe that, except for our staff. They know that. So, uh, but no, I'm serious. The fact is you're going to sin. And when you trust Christ, positionally, you are right with God. 
That's called justification. God has forgiven you. The blood of Jesus has covered your sins. And when you stand before God, he will not see your sins. Now, the devil's going to try to accuse you. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He's going to try to point those things out, but God will no longer remember your sins, and he will no longer see your sins. Why? Because all he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been imputed to your behalf. And that's good news. So the the bad news is you're a sinner. Uh, Even after you're saved, you're going to sin. The good news is you have been declared righteous. Therefore, you are a saint. You are right in the eyes of God. Now, the problem is there are many Christians, even if they know this, they don't live like it. And it's kind of like the Israelites, they, they have been delivered they have been promised by God this incredible land. But they didn't live like it. They didn't believe it. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that their sin, you know what their sin was? He said, well, their sin was the sin of idolatry. No, they did that later, but that wasn't their sin. They said, well, their sin was sexual in nature. Well, they did that later too, but that was not their sin. That was not what God uh, just left them in the wilderness for 40 years. You know what their sin was? It was the sin of unbelief. They did not believe what God had said. And there are many of us that struggle with that. God has declared us righteous, but we don't believe it. God has declared us to be holy in his eyes, but we don't live like it. And the fact is, you and I must believe if we're going to enter into the grace of God and the rest of God that God has promised to us. You know what the rest of God is? It's simply just resting in belief. Even when things are bleak. You know what the Israelites did at the Red Sea? They rested. They rested in God. They didn't know where it was going to come from. Moses said, you know what? I just believe God's going to deliver us. And he did. And so what you and I need to learn to do is to believe that is entering into God's rest. And it's not got anything to do with salvation. And God's grace is freely given. You don't earn it. Did you know that no matter what you do, good or bad, you cannot reduce God's grace that has been given to you? Now, what you can do is not live like it. What you can do is not believe it. What you can do is not enter into that rest because of unbelief. But God's given it to you. He's promised it to you just like he promised the nation of Israel And here's what I want you to see. Just like the Israelites, you can be delivered, but disobedient. And I'm afraid that's where many Christians live today. They've been delivered. God's forgiven them. He's poured out his grace. He's justified them. They have a home in heaven. There's nothing you could do to make God not love you anymore. But they're just disobedient. They've been delivered but they don't live like it. And as a result, what you will do as a, as a believer, just like the Israelites, you're going to wander. Not wonder, like I wonder what happened, but wander as in being lost. Well, what do you do when you've blown it? What do you do when you've sinned? Well, there's three things I want to show you today that I believe will help you. Number one, when you've blown it, admit it to God. That's the first thing you got to do. You know what the word repentance means? It means to agree with God. It means to walk with him. It means to walk the same direction he's going. And it's a a misunderstood word. And it's a word that a lot of people have rejected as being oppressive. It is actually one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us. It is one of the most beautiful words in the Bible. When I repent, it means I'm just going to agree with God about my life. And when I begin to admit to God then I can stop wandering. When Kim and I were first married, we, uh, we lived in Panama City. I was a youth pastor at a church there. I know it's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. The beach life, right? Um, we were there, and uh, my first job there, man, I worked so much. I worked a lot of hours, and Kim did as well. And I remember one day, Kim was feeling a little bit sad because I'd been working a whole lot, and she said this to me. She said, I think you love the church more than me. 
Now, being the numbskull that I was, not married very long, just not very smart at that point in our marriage, I said back to her, well, you know what your problem is? You don't love Jesus very much. Well, I know now, okay? I mean, I didn't then. Was that stupid? As as stupid as you can get. But you know where that came from? It came from my pride. It came from the fact that I was unwilling to examine my own life. It came from the fact that I just wanted to shift all the blame to her and not man up and look in the mirror myself. And I'm afraid that until I admitted my, admitted my sin to God, it just got worse. Finally, I admitted it to God, and I asked God to forgive me, and I asked her to forgive me. And thank God she's a forgiving person. But man, there for a while, it was a little rocky. It was a little rough. And I'm afraid that there are many Christians that are just like that. No matter what the sin is, the sin of unbelief, it could be sexual sin. It could be the sin of pride, the sin of lying, the sin of having a bad attitude, the sin of unfaithfulness, sins of the tongue where we say things we should not say just like I did then, the sin of materialism where we think that just getting a little more is what's going to make us happy, going to make us find our purpose in life. It's what's going to give us uh, the sense and the feeling of being just or being significant in life. And significance does not come from what you own. Significance comes only from God. It could be the sin of selfishness. Just like so many people, unrepentant disobedience causes bigger problems later. Just like with the Israelites, the bigger problems they faced later was those very people that God had given them the victory over, and they didn't believe it. They were the ones that caused them so many problems later. And I want you to listen to this statement I'm getting ready to make. They drifted for a lot of, a lot of years. Drift leads to distance, and distance leads to disconnection. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Drift leads to distance, and distance leads to disconnection. You know why there are so many Christians that struggle going to church, worshiping God, feeling connected in the church? It's because they don't even recognize that they're drifting. Now, every one of us is going to drift, myself included. And we have to have regular times where we come back and have those times of spiritual awakening where we turn to God and we pray and we ask God to help us see a new picture, a fresh vision of who Jesus is. But if you don't capture that, if you don't stop the drifting, it's going to lead to distance. It happens in a marriage. It happens in a church. Drift leads to distance, and distance leads to disconnection. I don't have to turn there, but in Revelation chapter 2, the last book of the Bible. Uh, God, there are seven churches there, and he's given them praise about some of the things they did and, and then challenging them on some of the things they did wrong. And he said to the church at Ephesus there, he said, uh, I've got someone against you, he said, because you have left your first love. You've left your first love. And, and for many years, I always thought what Jesus said was come back to your first love. But he didn't say that. You know what he said to that church there? He didn't say, come back to your first love. He said, do the deeds that you did when you were in love with me. You know what that tells me, this beautiful picture? You can stop drift by doing what you did when you first fell in love with Jesus. Sometimes that's serving. Sometimes that's being in a small group. Sometimes that's giving. Sometimes that's being around the church. Sometimes it's just making sure you attend church. But the reason that so many people feel disconnected in church is not that the church isn't friendly. It's not because the pastor's not friendly. And it's not because people have changed at the church. It's that you have begun to drift and you have not arrested that and drift leads to distance, and distance leads to disconnection. I'm glad that 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible. It says, if we confess our sins, he, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do you do when you've fallen? What do you do when you've sinned? What do you do when you've failed? Admit it to God. 
In case you're wondering, he already knows. You're not catching him by surprise. If you confess your sin to him, he's not going, I had no idea you did that. He already knows. So just admit it to God. If you're drifting, admit it to God. Ask for his help. He is there for you. He wants you to rest in him. He's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to make you try to struggle around in the dark. He's not going to leave you where you don't have answers. You admit it to him. And he promises to help you. Here's the second thing you do. What do I do when I've blown it, when I've sinned? Number two, you trust God to be with you. I don't know if I could give you better news. You ever notice that when you sin, the first thing that the devil tricks your mind into believing is that God doesn't want to hear from you? I know times in my life I've sinned, and you know what the last thing I think I should do at that point, though I know it should be the first thing I should do, is talk to God or pray. I mean, in times like that, I feel like, oh, I can't pray right now. But that's the time you should pray. The truth is that you and I need to learn to trust God to be with us because he promises to be with us. We need to learn to live in faith, not fear. Do you know what they said, the reason that they didn't want to believe God? Because there were giants there. We fear giants, don't we? We fear the giants in our schedule, the giants at our work, the giants in our family, the giants in our life. But we don't have to fear the giants. God said that he will conquer them for you. God let them wander in the wilderness for a time of pruning. And I want you to understand this as a Christian. God is always going to prune you before he uses you. If at the very least he needs to prune the pride out of you. You ever notice that a lot of times we are impressed with our own talent? Kind of prideful? Well, <laughs> I tell you what, uh, y'all have had that problem, but the reason you've had that problem is you've never had me working on it. You ever felt like that? I remember when we started this church, uh, I'd met with a group of, of seasoned pastors, men that had started churches, and I had one guy tell me, he said, just trust me, the people that start with you are not going to finish with you. And on our very first Sunday, we had 227 people in attendance. And I thought to myself, he just doesn't have a clue who I am. Maybe those other people would, la- would leave, but not from me because they've never had me as their pastor. Here's what I want to do. For the people that started with us, you were there on that very first Sunday, even before uh, that first Sunday. Would you stand right now, please? One, two, three, four, five. Let's give these people a hand. Do you get my point? A lot of times we're so full of pride. We think we've got the answers. We think we are the ones. But sometimes God has to prune that out of you. And so admit it to God. Trust God to be with you. And then here's the last thing and we're done. Reject the lies. Reject the lies. I'm going to show you three lies that they believed. Lie number one, they thought it was too difficult. They said, this land is going to devour anyone. Did you know that's a lie? A lot of people think that it's too difficult to live for God. A lot of people think that it's too difficult to rest in Jesus. They think it's too difficult to trust him. But that's a lie. It's not too difficult. A lot of people think it's just asking way, way too much, but it's not. It's not too difficult because whatever God has asked you to do, he's already put in you. Did you know that? He's never asked you to obey that he hasn't already made a way. It's not too difficult. That's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. Lie number two, it's too much. You know what they said about themselves? We felt like grasshoppers in their sight. And they thought that same thing too. That's a lie. It's not too much. It's not too difficult. And then line number three, and this is the big one. I'm not enough. That is something that we all struggle with. I'm just not good enough. 
oh, I know what they want down at that church, and if they really knew who I was, they would believe that the ceiling would fall in when I walked. If they really knew what I was really like, they wouldn't embrace me. If they really knew what I had done, no. The lie is that you're not good enough. Well, of course you're not good enough, but Jesus is. He has forgiven you. He has redeemed you. He has justified you. It's okay. You're enough through him. Uh, They believe the lie that I'm not strong enough. Well, of course you aren't. But God is. And he promises to give you the strength to be faithful, to stop wandering and to be connected. That's God's promise. Uh, People believe the lie that I'm not enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. It says that's what they thought too. Well, you may not feel that you're good enough. And in of your own strength and of your own power, you're right. You may not feel like that you're smart enough. And I don't care how smart you are. You cannot outsmart life. You ever notice that? No matter how much you prepare, and I believe in preparation. And I believe in education. And I believe in real good discipline and good effort and hard work. I believe in all that. But sometimes life is just more than you and I can handle. And sometimes life throws us a curveball. And sometimes life turns out differently than what we expected, right? And you think, I'm not enough. But you don't have to be because Jesus is. Jesus is is enough. And I don't know about you, but I believe that is good news. Good news. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are enough. Lord, we don't have to be enough, but you are. Lord, sometimes we feel like it's too much, but you're more than enough for us. Sometimes we think it's too difficult, but your strength is beyond ours. God, help us to reject the lies of the enemy and help us to begin to believe what you said about us and what you say from the word of God to us. Before I finish my prayer, if you'll just continue to to pray with me. I wonder if anybody here would say, Pastor, you know, I need Jesus today. I need to be saved. I need Christ for my salvation. Well, whether you're here in the room or online, understand that salvation comes because of what God does for us, of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It's not through your good works. It's not through being a member of the church. It's not through being a member of a small group or being baptized or giving money. You don't owe God. The fact is, Jesus did everything that was necessary on the cross for our salvation. And the Bible says that if you will believe that, it's that act of believing, it's that act of faith in Him, it's that act of faith in His finished work that will be enough for God to reach out and to save you. So I wonder if today you would pray something like this. And once again, it's not a sinner's prayer. You don't have to say these words. It's just an act of faith. But to be able to put words to your belief, say something like this to God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose from the grave on the third day. I believe that he's coming again. And I believe that if I ask, you will save me. And so right now, I'm asking. I'm asking. For those of you online, if you ask right now, please click that button at the bottom of the page that says, I pray to receive Christ. I wonder if there's anyone in the room today that would say, I'm asking today for God's salvation in my life. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that at all? Anybody like that would say, Pastor, today I am asking for God to save me. Thank you. Thank you. And then before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you would say that God's speaking to you about something. Maybe it's about drifting. Maybe it's about the sin of unbelief. Maybe it's because you're doubting God. I don't know what it is, but you say, Pastor, God's speaking to me about something today from the Word of God, from the message. 
And I want you to pray with me today. Would you just raise your hand? Anybody like that today? All right. God bless you. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you are more than enough. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.